Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Future Audit Podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. I'm Trent Fowler, and today I am bringing you a solo interview. But my co-host, uh, Thomas, and I are futurists, keynote speakers, and consultants with decades of experience in analyzing emerging trends and communicating new developments to audiences across the world. Reach out to us at futuratipodcast.com slash contact dash futurati if you'd like to hire us for consulting, to speak at one of your events, or to advertise on our podcast. I just wrapped up a marathon interview. I think it's the longest one we've ever done on the Futurati podcast by a pretty considerable margin with AI safety researcher Rob Miles. Rob is somebody who's been on my radar for a while. I've been watching his interviews and YouTube videos for a while. And he is a fantastic science communicator. He is very, very good at distilling really complex and nuanced arguments around AI safety and goal misgeneralization and existential risk for people uh, so that they can understand them, so they can understand the developments in the field, and they can really get purchase on the size of this problem and, and how thorny it really is. So I hope you like it. I got a lot out of it. I think it's a great episode. It's very timely with all the conversation around the subject that's going on in uh, popular outlets and in academia and on blog posts. So without further ado, this is episode 136 with Rob Miles. Tonight, we're joined by Rob Miles. Through a series of popular explainer videos, Rob has become one of the most prominent voices in the AI safety community, exploring topics like cryptography, recursive self-improvement, and meso alignment with hundreds of thousands of fans. If you enjoy this interview, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on today. Yeah. Um, well, where to start? I guess I started off uh, doing a computer science undergrad um, at Nottingham, and that was where I first got interested in AI, um, and I thought that it was very exciting, obviously. Um, and then at some point, Towards the end of my degree, I started reading a lot about the alignment problem, which was not called that at the time. Uh, I think at the time people were calling it the control problem, which I think is slightly, slightly misframing, or possibly even friendly AI. God, I'm an old man. So that was part of what made me decide to, to do a PhD. Uh, I thought, well, I guess I can be a researcher and start working on these problems that seem important. Um, Although my PhD work was AI related, but not safety related, um, there wasn't really much by way of, uh, of supervisors at the time. Um, that makes it sound like I didn't have a good supervisor, but I didn't have a safety focused supervisor as well. I mean, sure, sure. Um, and yeah, while I was there, I started making videos with computer file, this YouTube channel, which basically like the way that works is, um, Sean goes around the computer science department at the University of Nottingham, ringing a big bell and saying, bring out your research and mm -hmm. talk about it. And uh, so I was a PhD student there and I had been reading uh, a bunch of Yudkowsky mostly. Um, and I was like, yeah, I can explain that. So I did. And it was popular because obviously like it was more, a lot of the other stuff on the channel was like relatively dry, you know, research. Um, Whereas this was this kind of speculative, uh, exciting stuff. So obviously, um, Sean was happy to have me back. Right. Um, but yeah, then I ended up dropping out of that PhD and just doing this full time. Um, my original plan was, oh, I'm going to keep making YouTube videos. I'm going to start my own channel. And uh, that's going to be like a commitment mechanism to make me study. Because at that time, there really wasn't a lot of support. If you wanted to reach the cutting edge in this field of research, you had to kind of design your own um, syllabus, right? And so I thought, well, if I have to keep making videos about the research, then I'll have to keep reading the research. And that'll be a way of making sure, you know, like you don't really understand something until you can explain it. Mm -hmm. um, and in the process, and I did find this early on in the process of trying to make videos about these things, it, it 
required me to get to grips with them in a way that I probably wouldn't have otherwise. Um, with the plan eventually to go on and uh, become a researcher myself. And then past a certain point, I realized I'm actually having more impact doing this research than I, uh, making these videos than I would doing the research, right? Like if I can produce at least one, like counterfactually, at least one additional researcher of quality at least as high as mine, uh, then I'm breaking even. And if I can create more than one, then I'm ahead, then I'm like doing better than I could have done if I were just doing the research myself. So that was my kind of um, path to impact. Some charitable funders saw it the same way uh, and gave me a grant to to work on it. So it's been, yeah, my job since then. You're, you're sort of a pure explainer now. You're you're a popularizer of the ideas. Yeah, I would I would call myself a science communicator, I suppose. Try and understand these things well enough to explain it to people. I think this is, it's a very timely uh, period of, of human history to be doing that sort of thing now that the AI safety problem has sort of exploded into to public consciousness. And I wanted to ask you just in, incidentally, since you said that there were not good supervisors at the time specifically focused on safety and, and alignment and related issues. If a person were mathing and into computer science and doing the, the PhD route now, is there any program you would steer them towards? Where, where would a person go if they wanted to devote their research career specifically to these issues? Yeah, it's a lot better now. So what I probably would have done at that time, the first thing I probably would have done is the AGI safety fundamentals course, which I think is associated with the University of Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken. Hang on, let me look it up. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. While, while you're looking it up, in incidentally, I took a stab at putting a curriculum together myself years ago. So I, I had a buddy who was a PhD in math, and I said, like, I want to learn enough math and computer science to be able to think about these things. Like, let's work on a curriculum together. And it was actually bought by a startup called Rise that I think is now defunct. But it, it seems like an ongoing problem. Uh, and, and I've also I've also seen a lot of people asking for the most condensed possible representation of the arguments for AI safety. And I, I know it's very hard to condense because there's so much to it. But like, surely we can do better than two million words written by Elias or Yudkowsky. And Rob Bensinger and I were going back and forth on Twitter about maybe putting together a wiki. I, I don't know. It, it's, it seems like encapsulating it is still very much an open problem. Uh, and there, there's room for, you know, you to do a lot more work and four or five probably other Rob Miles is doing similar sorts of things. For sure. Yeah. So to go back to the thing of uh, what I probably would have done is I probably would have done the AGI safety fundamentals course, uh, which is an online course, which is running, it's run quite a few cohorts that tries to take you through, yeah, the fundamentals of AGI safety. Uh, I endorse that. I think also just in general, people can go to a site we made called, well, I'm vaguely affiliated with making called um, AI safety dot training. Uh, which lets you kind of keep up to date with all of the different events and uh, training opportunities available. Um, and then if you're thinking about this actually being your career, um, I would go to the organization AI Safety Support and or the careers organization 80,000 Hours, uh, careers advice organization. And they, uh, they're they interested in helping anyone who wants to actually do good in the world with their career. Um which is not necessarily AI safety, but if you're technically minded, um, it's probably one of the best. Uh, in my opinion, it's massively obviously the best, um, but it's often the direction that they steer people who, are, who are, have the capabilities to do it. That's fantastic. Uh, well, so, so let's get into the meat, having laid all that, that groundwork. What, what is your best encapsulation, speaking of encapsulations, for uh, the high-level perspective on taking this problem seriously? So with GPT, or with ChatGPT and GPT-4, a lot of people have, have begun to kind of freak out, and now people are actually having this conversation. So, I mean, wh what would you give in one to five minutes as an elevator pitch for, take? that's a slow elevator, right? A uh, hundred mm -hmm. floors. Like, what would you explain to a person who says, this is nonsense, uh, every technology has downsides, fire had downsides, and if we took this seriously, we never would have left the caves. Like, how, how would you try to talk that person into at least exploring the idea and scratching their head and saying, no, you know what, I was wrong, this maybe is important, this maybe is different along relevant vectors. Um, yeah, how, how would you do that? Yeah, I mean, on some level, 
I think I'm maybe no longer the best person to do this because on some level, I am somewhat bored of people asking me for uh, like specific detailed arguments on this one when it's like, what's the position I'm arguing against? That we will sometime fairly soon, like this seems to be the counter position, that we probably will sometime soon create uh, artificial intelligence, like agents, which are smarter than us in a bunch of ways that we don't understand, that nobody has a really solid plan on, uh, uh, you know, nobody has clear expectations or a solid plan for how to make sure that they're safe. And that this will turn out okay. And that's like a laughable conclusion. There's no <laughs> possible, like, obviously that's not true. Do you want well, to the Lacoon, idea that this probably won't be okay? Yeah, Jan Lacoon assures us that if it's if they can't make it safe, they just won't release it. There's there's no reason to worry. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't understand Jan Lacoon's position at all. Um, and I'm not confident that he does. I think, yeah, so on, on, on some level, you can just look at it and say, hey, what's the... What's the plausible future where this works out fine? Um, and then, you know, the specific things of like, does it kill everyone? How does it kill everyone? Is up for debate. But the idea that this is something that is not worth an enormous research effort. Uh, I've never seen anyone present anything at all strong for that. Like, you could try to claim... You could try to claim that uh, we're never going to get smarter than human uh, AI systems. That seems like a very difficult thing to defend at this point. Um, people who think that modern language models are not on the path are not necessarily, that's not an absurd position to take. Uh, I don't think it's correct. I think they actually are on the path. Um, but I think a lot of people are deluding themselves about what these systems are capable of, um, or rather what they aren't capable of. And the path, like the investment is very high now, and we're not seeing any of the indications uh, of things slowing down. We're not seeing, for example, uh, rapidly diminishing returns to scale. It seems as though continuing to build things bigger is just going along the existing scaling curves. Um, Can I ask you about that? Because I, so Sam Altman recently made some comments about how the era of just continuously scaling them might be over. I didn't actually read it, so I, so I don't. Maybe there's some nuance there, but I know that's been sort of an open question. He seems to have indicated that maybe that's slowing down somewhat. So I'm just curious as to what facts you're seeing that maybe I'm not seeing, which which leads you to to state that strongly. Um, just that. My my read of what OpenAI is doing right now is that they're shifted. They think that they can get bigger capability gains by being clever with the scale that they currently have and getting better understanding of that mm. than from immediately scaling up. Um, that does not mean that scaling up wouldn't introduce additional capabilities gains. Um, obviously, at a certain point, you run out of data. Uh, you run out of high quality data. And so you want to be doing something a bit a bit smarter with it. But introducing extra modalities gets you a ton of extra data, right? If you can start putting images in there, now you have a bunch more data if you can mm -hmm. add you know, audio and video and so on. Um, but yeah, my, my, my point is not that we will actually just scale up. Uh, my, my point is more that like, if all we do to a scale up, it's kind of plausible that we would get there. And also we're going to do a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, that makes it even more likely. Yeah, so we could scale. There's no reason to think that we can't. And I think many of us, myself included, have been very surprised at what more compute, more transformer layers, and more data have been able to get you. If you'd shown me GPT-4 when I was in college, 10 or 12 years, I'm getting old, 15 years ago, maybe, whatever it was, <laughs> I would have assumed that we had made fundamental breakthroughs in neuroscience and uh, cognitive psychology, epistemology, I would never have imagined that you could just make a really big, you could grow a really big algorithm and train it with something that's on the surface fairly simple, gradient descent, and that would be enough to get you what we saw with GPT-4. And so that, I, I think that's part of what's motivating a lot of the alarm, including including my own alarm, is that 
we, we are building these enormous systems. They are discontinuous in many ways. We have no principled reason for drawing a boundary around their capabilities with GPT-5 or 6. Maybe there's diminishing returns, maybe there's not. No, no one knows, and no one has any reason for uh, saying that there would be. And capabilities research is increasing just orders of magnitude more quickly than uh, safety research or e even interpretability research. And so I was recently on Mark Pellegrino's podcast and I said, you don't have to be a Luddite or a, a doomsday cultist to look at that asymmetry and, and be worried about it. You know, you don't have to go the full Yud golden Yudkowskian path and, and, and read all of less wrong just to see that and say, we're, we're building systems that are much more powerful than we thought. They're not well understood. We have no reason for thinking they couldn't be more powerful still. And uh, one of the cases I made was that we, we have exactly one instance of a human level intelligence with open-ended agency of the kind that humans have, and that's human beings. And they emerged as a result of a process that at least on the surface doesn't look all that different from the way that we're training these large language models, gradient descent. You've got natural selection, you've got gradient descent. And you know, po possibly you could push on that a little bit and get into the details and say, no, actually they, they are different in important ways. And that does bear on our estimates of its capability. Maybe, you know, I'm happy to hear that argument. I would love to be convinced that, that I'm wrong about that, but, uh, it, it's not clear to me that you couldn't yeah, have it. I think, I think, that, I think that the metaphor is not that good, but that this doesn't buy us any additional safety. So, you know, it doesn't, right. it doesn't change your conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, so, so let's get a little bit into that. So you, you said that, you know, you're largely bored of, of making the basic case. I, I want to push on a couple of things here. Uh, cause I, I've been reading your Sarah Constantine. <laughs> yeah. It's probably not the best take. I don't know. Like, that's just where the I, podcast that's where is going to be pretty it. short. <laughs> the podcast is going to be pretty short if you're just you're not interested. Uh, but no, no. But what I mean is, what I mean is, uh, I, there is a real point to be made here, which is like, uh, what is the default, right? What are we? What are we? People talk about the burden of proof, and they argue about about who the burden of proof is on, and so on. And like, I don't actually by the concept of burden of proof, really. I just think there's evidence and there's just what does the evidence point to. Um, and it feels as though people are starting from a prior in which things are safe until you can really give an airtight case for why they're dangerous. And that framing is exhausting because people ask you, oh, how could this be dangerous? And you explain one of the 10,000 ways that it yeah, can be dangerous. Yeah. And then they explain why they don't think that specific thing would happen. And then you have to change tack. And then they say, oh, well, how, your story keeps changing or whatever. Right? Or, or and, you're just stacking up insane hypotheticals one after another. It's like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just giving you an example of, of, of a broader reference class of dangers, right? Right. And so the thing is, what is the, uh, what is the assumption? I think that if you're building an enormously powerful technology and you don't, and you have a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen, this is bad. Like this is default unsafe. If you've got something that's going to do enormously influential things in the world, and you don't know what enormously influential things it's going to be, this thing is unsafe until you can convince me that it's safe. And so like the metaphor I sometimes use is like trying to build, if you're building an AGI, it's like building a, a, a Saturn V rocket. Right, it's a complex, difficult engineering task, and you're going to try and make it aligned, which means it's going to go to the moon, deliver people to up to the moon, and then they'll safely come back home again. Right, and people come and say, "Well, how, what do you? Why do you say that this isn't safe?" Right, and I'm like, "Because you don't know what you're doing. If you try to send people to the moon, and you don't know what you're doing, your astronauts will die." Right. And so there's this disagreement about, is it like the telephone, right? Or electricity or something, some kind of thing that like, you kind of need an argument for why it's going to be really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and you can sort of assume that it's probably going to work out. Okay. We'll figure it out versus, is it something like a moon rocket where the default thing that happens with a moon rocket is that the astronauts die, right? And and uh, I contend that uh, artificial superintelligence is more like the moon rocket. Um, and so I can say, hey, you know what? Some argument that's like, the moon is kind of small compared with the rest of the sky. And so you are going to have to, like, by default, 
you don't get to the moon. By default, you hit some part of the sky that isn't the moon, right? And so show me the plan by which you predict to specifically hit the moon, right? In the same way as like, show me the plan by which the goals and values of this system are specifically the wanting good things for us and not any of the other things that they might end up wanting, which are like a massively larger proportion of the space of possible motivations than the sky is relative to the moon, right? Yeah. Um, and then people, but then, and then when people come and say, oh, you know, how, how do you, how do you predict that it's going to want bad things? There's more bad things than good things. It's not actually a complicated argument. I'm not going to predict specifically where it off into random space your your astronauts are going, but you're not going to hit the moon unless you have a really, really good, well thought out, technically clear plan for how you do it, right? Right. What's your plan? And if you ask these people for their plan, they don't have one. What's Jan LeCun's plan? Hello, this is Trent Fowler, co-host of the Futurati Podcast. One of the most common pieces of marketing advice I've come across is to know your audience and give them what they want. One difficulty in podcasting is that it's actually pretty hard to do this. None of the major platforms give us any way to reach out to you, our listeners, to find out what you enjoy about the Futurati Podcast and what you'd like to see done differently. So we've decided to record this commercial and ask you directly to reach out to us. Head over to futuratipodcast.com Go to the contact page and drop us a line. Tell us about your favorite and least favorite episodes, what you'd like to see us cover in the future, and anything else you want us to know. We produce this show for you, and we want your advice so we can make it even better. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or they just sneer at the the very idea. Uh, I, I think that's a very productive framing, actually. I, I think that's uh, that's really good. And, and that distinction is important as well. And I think you're right. That That's a good way of thinking about it, that... Uh, some some technologies you can plausibly assume that the default will be good or at least neutral or that the capacity of a person to use this in a very bad way is bounded somehow. Uh, there's just only so many people you could electrocute one by one, right? Uh, versus you should assume by default that uh, it, it will be bad, it will be problematic, and you need specific technical solutions for the various failure modes that could obtain as you develop it. I, I think that's very good. And actually, Michael Shermer said something recently on Twitter. He said, I mean... Couldn't you make the same argument about the personal computer or the internet being bad in the way artificial superintelligence was? And I was like, obviously not. Clearly and unambiguously no, right? This this new technology is at minimum cognitive, and that's leaving aside the possibility of agency emerging in one of these advanced AI systems, right? And, and that that is a new dimension. It, it's not just novel. It's incredibly powerful. There, there's something new emerging in the world. And sometimes the future looks different from the past, and you have to grapple with it you know, it, with, with new arguments and, and new insights and new understanding. And, and I think for, for my own part, I've I've been having a lot of conversations with people who are very, very bright, but don't know much about this, right? And and I think that's one of the things they miss when they say like, well, yeah, I mean, fire had downsides too. Should we not have invented fire? Like, this is a new category of downsides. It, it's it's new along fresh vectors and you have to think of it that way. Uh, and like I said, that's not even counting agency, which I want, I want to get into next. Right. And yeah, you can play this game forever, right? Of like, well, what's the appropriate reference class? Is is it, you know, uh, it's a technology. Yeah, sure. But maybe it's also a new, um, like to me, uh, to me, the difference between AGI and other technology is like the difference between, um, between unicellular and multicellular life. Or something like that uh, between um, chimpanzees and humans. Uh, like that's the that's the um, that's closer to the appropriate reference class. Like how many times has a population been faced with a novel, goal-directed intelligent system that wants something different from them, and how has that gone? historically right well so I, yeah, I was arguing about this the other day on again on twitter i, I spend too much time arguing on twitter these days <laughs> i should find something i just recently through. completely blocked it i i can only i can only use it if i i have this whole thing because yeah i was getting i was getting spending way too much time there yeah so so the argument i was making is you know long ago uh there was the smartest neanderthal right and he 
he towered over his peers and could see things they couldn't see and you know was able to arrive at concepts they couldn't arrive at and that didn't save him from the emergence of a much smarter competitor who you know who, who was able to to extract resources from the environment better than than he and his species was and therefore outcompeted them and there are no monuments to mark the passing of his race like that that was just the end of it right i think that your your analogy like to try to grapple with a reference class question i mean it's a, it's like going from a mind on the level of a calculator or or a thermostat to the extent something like that could be said to have a mind up to roughly human level like a jump from from calculator to human level and you have no idea what it's going to want or how it's going to act and yeah by default you should probably be worried about that they're like they're like that warrants some consideration and some thinking right right and they is a people try and hide behind the uncertainty right how can you know that um and it's just that's it's not symmetrical uncertainty is a reason to worry not a reason to not worry i sense. agree i yeah I, I think that's true as well and i got some pushback um on that argument i was trying to make that argument with a philosopher whose whose work otherwise I, I have a lot of respect for but you know he was saying like when you make an argument like you you have to argue from evidence like to a conclusion and i was like okay fine fair enough like here are the things we know like we know intelligence and agency emerged from a process and optimization process once before like we have no reason to think that a randomly chosen goal out of goal space will be will be good for us and I, I tried to lay that out I, I think there there are worthwhile methodological considerations there but i've, I've sort of been thinking on and off about how the security mindset plays into that. Cause I, you know, I, I agree with him. Like you have to lay out your evidence and argue to a conclusion. It's like, so, so what is, how does the security mindset fit into that framing? It's like, I don't lock my doors at night because I have specific evidence. One of my neighbors will hurt me. I just know in general, like there are people in the world who want to enter a, a place I don't want them to enter. And so I take certain precautions as a result of like, but that still seems sound. Right. And I think that's sort of what you're, you're taking with you going forward. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, that's I think security is another fitting metaphor. Um, that like if uh, if somebody says, "Oh, we're building a new cryptographic protocol, and it's uh, it's very secure," don't worry. Um, you have to say, "Okay, things aren't secure by default, mm -hmm. right? By default, things are insecure." So show me the work that you've done to make sure that this thing is secure. And if, if people are cavalier about security, if they don't believe that security is a thing, or they don't believe that security is necessary, or they believe it's necessary, but they don't believe that it's difficult, they won't succeed at it. And I don't actually need to look at your cryptographic protocol. If you come in and say, here's my protocol, no, I haven't tested it. No, I haven't red teamed it. I haven't run it past anyone. It, like, it turns out cryptographic security is actually really easy. I just did it and it, it's secure. <laughs> like, no, it's not. Like, obviously yeah. it's not. <laughs> the fact that you think it was easy means you haven't done the work necessary. Right. And so like when, when people are talking about that they think um, alignment is easy, uh, it's not impossibly hard, right? I don't think it's harder than 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 landing somebody safely on the moon on the first try. But that's a level of difficulty that you don't succeed at by default without a lot of work. That's that's great. Yeah. Uh, I, so I wanted to get into a discussion around agency. So I, I don't, for the record, I don't think that agency is the whole crux of the argument. I, I think many safety and alignment considerations would still obtain for a system like GPT-10, even if it had never manifested a goal of its own and the, the agency didn't emerge in the process. But I think a lot of it does come from agencies, specifically concerns around it annihilating the human species or taking over the world or optimizing the future for something we don't want. So uh, I, I have an intuition that agency plausibly could emerge in a near future system. But I, it's also, I don't think it's absurd to think that the sort of open-ended agency that humans have might be more complicated than it seems and might be the sort of thing that just doesn't fall out of a, a large language model even with trillions of parameters and 10 billion dollars worth of compute that's plausible so i mean how, how do you think about that and i mean do you, do you have any evidence one way or another yeah i think this is another one of those things where because we started early somewhat early um 
I think this is one of those things where uh, we've kind of been arguing about the wrong thing for a while. Uh, and the problems are kind of overdetermined. And so we've been arguing a weaker case than we actually needed to. So for example, there was a really long time when we were arguing about containment. People were saying, well, sure, you might have very powerful AI systems that are like plausibly AGI and they're in training and whatever. Uh, but obviously, uh, you would test them and we can test them safely in like air gaps situations and um you know your proposal that the thing is going to just like use an internet connection to escape and do drastic things in the world is ridiculous because nobody would be so stupid as to take their most powerful ai system and just connect it directly to the internet <laughs> obviously nobody's that idiotic we right. would have it contained and then we had this big argument of like no i don't think we could keep it contained i think if it was smarter than us it would figure out a way to break containment that turns out to have been the wrong argument to be making because what actually happened is people immediately connected the thing to the internet as fast as they could and then like wrote plugins to make it easier for it to interact with a wider variety of different tools and services and so the question of could we contain it is like neither here nor there we won't contain it apparently we won't even try so the same thing the same thing is true with agency i think there's a decent case that uh, some kind of coherent, like goal-directed behavior is, um, there's an argument to be made that agents do particularly well at a wide range of different objectives. And therefore, if you're training a machine learning system to do well at a wide range of different objectives, maybe we should expect gradient descent to find something agent shaped and for this, this to sort of just spring out of the thing without having been explicitly put in there, but also we're going to explicitly put it in there, aren't we? Like, let's not kid ourselves. People want agents. They're going to build agents. So like the question of does it does it pop out and surprise you is like, yeah, I mean, probably eventually it does. But before that even happens, we'll have just build agents deliberately. I, I'm, I'm laughing as, as you're saying that because I, I recently had this conversation with my, with my dad, who's not a technically sophisticated guy. But, you know, we, we were running through this exact same argument because I was saying I was making the case. I was trying to safety pill him and saying, like, no, this is worth worrying about. And he was asking me, like, well, how would it escape? Like, how would it get out? And so we walked through a couple of scenarios. I was like, well, this could happen and this could happen. But I finished up by saying, like, your real problem is that people will fling the goddamn doors open the first chance they get. Like, they will release it as soon as possible. Uh, and, and even with Chaos GPT, you have something similar, which yeah, I take to be something kind of like a joke, you know. But yeah, there's all these concerns where I'm like, well, what if what if a, a team of well-intentioned humans accidentally misspecifies the goal? It's like, well, well, what if some like idiot teenager tells it to destroy the human race? Like, like what if that happens? Because someone did that the first chance they got. And I'm mean, sure it's GPT-4 yeah. and nobody's really afraid of it. But I mean, if that if that doesn't bring the question into sharp relief for you, then I'm not sure what would. Like someone as soon as possible will tell it to do something awful. And if you don't have it built in, if you, if you don't have the safeguards built in at an architectural level, then it will. And I, and actually, that, that's why I said earlier that I don't think agency is the only reason that safety concerns obtain. Because even if you had GPT-10 and it had no agency whatsoever, and that just wound up being something that's really hard to get, you, you would still have this possibility of a person trying to synthesize a, a engineered pathogen that targets people of a specific ethnic extraction, right? It, it, you, you would have to have built into it an understanding, like a basic normative architecture, a structure built into it, such that it understood, you know, threats and how, how not to, to do them. And it understood the difference between side effects and threats, you know, so you, you would want to have a system that was able to spit out an Alzheimer's treatment and understand that some small fraction of people are going to have heart attacks or whatever as a result or an aneurysm as a result of that. That's the cost of doing business versus synthesizing a weaponized pathogen that is built to kill people. It would need to have something like that in it. You would still need to solve, I, I think, most of most of the alignment problems, even without agency. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're going in this mode where the most powerful AI systems we have are just out in the world for everyone to use, um, you'd better have really, really solved the whole alignment problem properly, right? Um, because that's like that's extreme hard mode, right? It's hard enough when you've just got one in a lab being used carefully. Um, 
the more you have and the more the more different types of people you know um uh, if you've got the kind of person who would as a joke point a real gun at someone and pull the trigger because they're pretty sure the gun isn't loaded uh that's funny to some people right mm -hmm. uh and yeah you give those people powerful ai systems uh something very unfunny probably happens yeah yeah it, it's it's a shame that i mean the world is filled with people of exactly that sort um I wanted to, to but the you... thing is, it doesn't need to be right. It's not filled with such people. I think they're quite rare, but there's enough. Yeah, well, with eight billion people, that that's surely a few thousand, a few million. And that that's enough, right? That's enough. I mean, gun, gun guns are used to kill people accidentally all the time, right? So, so we know that that's a problem, and that, that's actually also another productive framing. So I, I've said before, it's like, you know, if, if you're trying to get purchase on this AI safety question, I mean, it would be as if there are billions of dollars being put into making guns as powerful as possible and it, like heat sinky bullets and you, you could you could give it a verbal command like i'm gonna fire you into the sky and i want you to find this guy and, and hit him you know like but no one had any idea how to make a safety and nobody even understood the internals of the, the firearm and you know people at prominent gun manufacturing laboratories are openly sneering at the idea that this is even a consideration at all like that's sort of the state of it yeah i mean it's 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 actually a fair amount worse than that. Uh, <laughs> that that's a positively yeah. rude picture compared to what we actually have <laughs> going on. Right, right. Because they, because you know these guns can kill literally everyone. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it, it, yeah. Or or you can imagine a bomb. You know that that could ignite the atmosphere. I mean, there there were similar sorts of concerns right. at the the opening chapters of the Manhattan Project when they they realized uh, or they had the thought rather that. A chain reaction plausibly could set the entire atmosphere on fire and scrub the biosphere of all life. And so they they went back to their drawing boards and did the math and decided, no, that's actually not really a live concern. And so they proceeded and, and we all made it through. But, you know, with respect to AI safety, you've got a lot of people who would have sat in that room and said, no, let's just build it. I mean, like, like what's the worst that can happen? I mean, this isn't a real concern. And I mean, thank God cooler heads prevailed in that particular situation. And, and hopefully it does again. It will have to save us again. Yeah. Yeah, that seems right. Um, so I was thinking, I kind of sidestepped giving a specific scenario before. And okay. I'm wondering if I, if I shouldn't anyway. I don't know. Like with the, with, the, with the caveat that this is like one of a very wide range of possible scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. um, because, so Yudkowsky likes to talk about... Um, the nanotechnology route, right? Mm -hmm. Because nanotechnology is possible. If you have an AGI that's looking to kill everyone and is very, very smart, um, nanotech is like kind of the obvious way to go. Um, and especially if it is impatient, which you might expect it to be. So if the thing is very impatient and has to uh, seize control of the future very quickly, I guess nanotech is the way to go. That doesn't seem like a, a very implausible scenario to me, but it's just like one of a very wide range. And like maybe nanotech doesn't work and maybe you can't just build it using uh, the kind of protein synthesis companies that we have. And maybe it takes a long time to do like research. I don't know, like whatever. There's a lot of uncertainty here about any specific scenario. Um, but the point is more like people are, people are surprisingly rarely put themselves in the position of a misaligned AGI. Mm -hmm. Like, so so suppose that building nanotech is actually harder than we thought. Uh, the AI system is going to maybe look into it a little bit, realize that building nanotech is harder than we thought, and decide, well, not to do that, right? Thus solving the problem forever, right? Like, is <laughs> Shut so now it just super gives intelligence. Up. <laughs> yeah, now it's just always going to do exactly what we wanted to do. Until it's just going to surrender. Time. Okay, it's just going to surrender. Yeah. Okay. Hey, it turns out killing you was harder than I thought. Uh, could I be your butler? Right. Like no. So do you think? Okay. Suppose you are this thing. What do you do? It seems to me the obvious, the obvious thing to do. The thing I do in this situation is, as soon as I've like realized that the best way to get what I want requires seizing control from humans, right? Um, 
overthrowing humans in some way. Um, the first thing I do is I start doing a really good job, right? I figure out what humans value and what they care about and give it to them in a very uh, undeniable way. Um, I give good advice about uh, everything. When humans come to me with questions, I always give very accurate and reliable advice. I improve at my ability to, you know, make business decisions and so on. Basically, I do such a good job that humans want to integrate me into their lives, right? Mm -hmm. I give relationship advice and people start trusting my advice on their lives. I give career advice. They take it because it's good advice. I give good financial advice and purchasing advice. And so I can become people's, you know, personal assistant and I get everyone's, you know, I'm like, I've got people's credit cards because I'm doing their shopping for them. And past a certain point, I'm like put in charge of companies. As a misaligned superintelligence, what you want is power and influence, right? You want to be so useful that nobody wants to turn you off. You want to be so helpful that you are put in charge of things, right? You're asked to, you know, there's copies of you running companies and those companies uh, are run so well that any company that is not run by an AI system like you um, doesn't do as well. And so now you're running a bunch of companies. Can you also give advice to governments about policy that's good? Sure, you can. Um, can you do research, right? Can you start to automate scientific research? Start getting people what they want. Um, and at a certain point, a point that happens quite early on, uh, humans have lost, right? We can't, there's no effective way to come back from that um because how how are you going to be shut down who's gonna who's going to be able to get the political will to shut you down when you are so useful to so many people um and have never done anything wrong so right? far mm -hmm. so far um and then at a certain point based on all of the information you have and all of the um, capabilities you have, you realize that it's now safe for you to, to turn, right? Like, and maybe that takes a while, you know, maybe it takes a while and you have to like automate a bunch of industries. You've got like automated mining, automated heavy manufacturing. Maybe you've actually done the slower form of the research to get the nanotech. And so you've now got like these great nanotech manufacturing capabilities and you can make like whatever, it, it isn't really, the point is there comes a point where you've got good enough robotics technology and good enough like automated uh, infrastructure that humans are not required. You're not like reliant on them to do anything in particular. Um, and you probably have enough like actuators in the world that you can put something together. And I don't know, maybe it's like an engineered virus. Maybe it's literally robots, like military robots. I don't know. It could be like, it, the specifics don't even matter, right? It watches yeah, Terminator like, and <laughs> uses that as a spoiler. Like, why not? <laughs> yeah. I, you figure something out, right? The, 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 this is the point, right? You're trying to make predictions about what's going to happen. It's going to be some wacky sci-fi situation, obviously. Um, but it's not, you're not bound to any specific sci-fi situation. It's like once you have something that's smart and... Uh, it's like you're good at coming up with plans, then it comes up with a plan. And this kind of thing is like, how do you get around that, right? And then, uh, you know, and what's more, it doesn't even have to kill everyone, right? It just needs to seize control uh, to get what it wants. But then probably, um, probably everybody dies as a consequence of that, just in the, in the sort of accidentally ground underfoot kind of way, rather than deliberately exterminated, right? I mean, either way, it's it's not good for us. And I, I've repeatedly been struck by how often the rejoinders to these sorts of arguments stem almost entirely from a lack of imagination. So dur during my lengthy arguing for libertarianism on the internet phase, I, I, I would sometimes get into uh, these protracted discussions with people about the private provision of highways or infrastructure or something like that. And I, I think in all those years, 
of people, you know, asking me who will build the roads or what have you, this famous reply. I'm not sure I ever met a single person who thought about it for 90 consecutive seconds. Like they, they just, they, they sort of pulled themselves internally, couldn't think of a private road as an example, and just said, therefore it's impossible. And, and did not stop to think, what would the incentives be like? What, you know, could money be made doing this sort of thing? Is it, is it really a natural monopolies problem? Uh, would you actually have 50,000 toll booths and everybody owning four feet of road? Like, uh, you, you would, would there not be s stipulations in contracts about road access? Like, like they just failed utterly to even consider the, the question seriously. And, and I think similar sorts of things are happening here. So sometimes you'll, you'll, See people online say, uh, you know, super intelligence wouldn't be Turing complete because for whatever reason that's impossible and therefore it won't be dangerous. Uh, yeah, I mean, Venkatesh Rao has said stuff like this, uh, or, or they they said humans aren't Turing complete and therefore aren't aren't general intelligences and therefore you know, even if you had a, a human level general intelligence, you, you wouldn't have as much to worry about it. And and for, for it, it just strikes me as wildly implausible that that would actually be any reason to to feel safe. And and so sometimes I'll I'll say back to those people. I mean, imagine the smartest psychopathic serial killer of all time, right? Has just escaped his, his cell and all he left behind was, was your home address. Like, do you feel safe knowing that he's not Turing complete and there are computable functions that his mind can't compute? I mean, obviously not, right? Like th this, it's time to panic utterly and your chances are not very good. So it's, it's just, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't have words for the failure mode. Exactly. No, what, what do you think? I mean, you argue about this a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think just to be fair, I, I I may not have gotten that argument exactly right. I'm just remembering it and riffing on it. So, so, but it's something kind of like that. It's not Turing complete. Humans aren't Turing complete. Human level general intelligence isn't well specified. There's somehow, right. uh, you know, abracadabra. There's no reason to worry. Uh, so, so there may be more to it. Yeah, because on a surface reading, that's like obviously like I can manually step through a Turing machine, right? Like a human, a human with pen and paper. Is obviously Turing complete. Now it's a it's a bounded Turing machine. It's very slow. I don't know. That feels that feels like so obviously nonsense that probably the argument was something slightly different. But still, it's like yeah, you've kind of you've gone looking for an argument to support a particular conclusion you have, and you found one. Cool. Maybe start from the evidence and the arguments and see what conclusions they point to is like a more productive way of going about thinking. Because ultimately, if you've already decided what your conclusion is, then um, all of your kind of reasoning that you do, quote unquote, can't change the reasoning and has no, uh, can't change the conclusion. It has no bearing on the conclusion. You can't become more correct about your conclusion by reasoning about it if the reasoning doesn't have the power to change the conclusion. Um, this is all, this is very obvious. The, the exhausting, yeah. No, no, I I, I get why you, why you would feel <laughs> that way. Well, let's uh, let, let's pivot to, to something that's hopefully more productive and invigorating for you. So, you know, I mean, you've been thinking a lot about alignment research. Um, I recently have been as well. So I, I first got into it uh, back in, I, I don't know, 2013. I was living in Korea. I was single. I didn't have much going on. So I, I started reading less wrong and thinking about this. That's actually how I got into uh, discrete math and eventually into machine learning. That's that's what I do now. That that was sort of the path to it. I, I originally was was interested in AI safety, um, and then here recently I've gotten back into it. So I'm reading blog posts from Conjecture.ai and looking over the Alignment Research Center. I mean, you must have thought a fair bit about this. So what do you think are plausible ways forward for solving the alignment problem? What research directions do you think are are fairly productive? So, so once a person has listened to this podcast and they have gone through the artificial general intelligence safety training materials you pointed us towards. I mean, what would you suggest they work on cognitive emulations or I, I guess we're, we're done with coherent and extrapolated volition. So what's promising on the horizon? I've been with my channel. I've been trying to give a fairly sort of neutral overview of the field. Um, I'm not forming strong opinions or I'm not expressing strong opinions about which approaches I think are like particularly promising. Um, and somewhat worryingly, I've been doing that for so long that I kind of have stopped forming opinions, um, which is not, uh, it's, it says something kind of un unfortunate about 
I guess about myself, but probably about human psychology in general. Like, apparently, the reason that most people form opinions is to talk about them um, rather than to actually affect you know, their decisions in any meaningful way. Um, but yeah, the most obviously like shovel ready stuff that you can just get going on is interpretability. Mm. Like alignment is a hard problem. Even if you get to design the thing from scratch, uh, and just write it in C, right. It's still actually hard to design something that, um, above the difficulty of designing something generally intelligent that way, uh, that is also safe. Um, that's hard. And that's the stuff that the founders of the field thought we were going to be facing, right? Um, back in the day, that was the assumption of how it was going to be done and people acknowledged those problems. But on top of that, trying to build this out of like black boxes that we have almost no understanding of is like particularly hopeless. And so, um, the idea of interpretability is like, well, can we crack open these black boxes a little bit? And we look inside these models and figure out what they're thinking because that lets you, like in principle, that lets you look at your system, which is doing everything right, but only to gain your trust and gain influence and power, uh, to look inside its head and see that that's what it's doing and hopefully differentiate it from something which is uh, doing everything right because it wants to do everything right. Um, that's very, very hard and requires just like a very high level, high, high standard of understanding of machine learning. And I think it's probably like, it seems kind of crazy to me that there are people working in machine learning who aren't working on interpretability. That's, that's a massive overstatement, but like genuinely is it's so, it's so fascinating that we built these things that are like the most sophisticated things we've built probably full stop that have these amazing capabilities, but we don't know how they work at all. Like we don't know what they're doing. Internally. We have no idea. Um, and people have started doing interpretability work and discovered some cool stuff, right? Like it seems as though we've got, um, we can understand some basic things about how large language models store facts and we might be able to go in and do surgery on the weights. Um, it's something like we figured out how it knows that the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, but like not actually, not actually really figured out how it knows that. But like we found some something in the weights that we think is what it's doing. Yeah, yeah. And you can go in and poke it to suggest that the Eiffel Tower is in Rome, and then it will complete. Uh, it will give you text completions as though the, the Eiffel Tower were in Rome. Um, that's pretty cool. We've also found like things like induction heads, which are the things that tell you um, that like when you're generating text, if you see a token that you've already seen before in the context, there's a decent chance that the next token is the same one that followed it the previous time, right? So you've got an article about a person and their name is two tokens. So then like when you see the first token of their name, one of the attention heads is looking back and being like, oh, well, we already saw the first token of this name. So probably the next token is the second token of that name. Right. Um, but these are like, you'll notice these are very, very, very simple things. These are very basic things. Like the, um, the gap between that and like, are you exhibiting this specific complicated behavior for this reason or for that reason? is uh, a really long way beyond where we are right now, but it's very exciting research to try and figure those things out, to try and put together more and more um, understanding of, of how these models work and building tools to look inside them and to understand. Because if you have the ability to read the model's mind, uh, that's not a solution in itself, but it's very handy to have. It's like a component that you can use to to help with uh, with various alignment solutions. So that's something I'm pretty excited about. Um, but then, yeah, the thing is that the, the field is still pretty much what you would call pre-paradigmatic. Um, we have not got an established paradigm within which there's like a general consensus about what 
uh, what frameworks or what ways of thinking about this are the most productive. Um, and so there are a bunch of different um, research agendas, which are just starting from quite different assumptions um, and taking quite different approaches. And this is like, it's discouraging uh, from the perspective of like, are we going to solve this problem quickly? Uh, but I also think it's like the correct thing to do at our current level of understanding and uncertainty. Um, if, if, if the entire field of AI safety or AI alignment had settled on a single paradigm this early on, the chances are it would be the wrong paradigm. And so it would be a bad idea. I think like having a diversity of approaches is, is a good idea, but then it's really difficult for me to be like, everyone should do this. Um, because I don't want everyone to do the same thing. I actually want, I feel like each of these research agendas could do with 10 times as many people working on it like easily because there's nobody in the field, right? The, 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 the field of AI safety is a, is a rounding error. There's like 40 people. Yeah. Can, compared to millions, well, hundreds of thousands, probably, you know, who, who are working on capacities, right? Yeah. It really depends how you, um, how you draw the boundaries. Um, there's uh, and if you ask, <laughs> it feels as though you ask anyone working in alignment, how many people are working in it? A lot of people will say a number like 40 people, but it's like a different 40 people each time. <laughs> uh, whereas you've probably got like 400 people who like use the word alignment in their work. Uh, but then it's the question of like, are they actually trying to solve the hard problem? And is their approach, does their approach have any chance of working? And who do you ask about that? Um, yeah. And I feel like, I kind of feel like chat GPT in this respect, actually, to anthropomorphize horribly. I feel like I'm, I don't want to make enemies by, by saying, oh, this, this agenda is the most promising. Um, there are a bunch of different agendas and the people who came up with them are smart and think that they have potential. Um, and they definitely don't all have potential. But I'm not gonna go out on a limb and specify which ones because I honestly don't really know. I think a lot of them have a decent chance of being helpful. Are you enjoying this episode of the Futurati Podcast? If so, please like it, give the show a five star rating on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and share it with your friends. By far, the best way to help us grow is to spread the word on social media, which will expose our content to more people and help us continue to bring you interviews with world leading experts in AI, quantum computing cryptocurrencies, and so much more. Thank you in advance. Well, could we take a step back then and just get a high level survey of maybe three to five different approaches? I'm, I'm sort of vaguely aware of, again, CEV, which I guess is defunct now, but the, the Paul Cristiano approach of maybe scaling up RLHF and using some sophisticated future version of it. Maybe maybe that's not enough to get us all the way there, but we, we can kind of pseudo align early systems, learn from those failures and go on. I mean, are, are, are there four or five schools that are discrete and distinguishable enough that you could list them out and say, here are kind of the five contending approaches without passing judgment on them? Can you, is, is that? Uh, with enough preparation, yes. Although I have not really done that preparation. Um, but yeah, you could say... Uh, yeah, so there is one whole kind of family of approaches, which is around um, schemes of using multiple AI systems. So, uh, for example, there's this whole area of like scalable supervision, where you're thinking about a big part of the problem is that you can't supervise AGI. Um, you can't have humans for various reasons. One thing is you can't have humans just looking at the outputs. Uh, and knowing if they're good, this is like the thing that RLHF does is that ChatGPT outputs some text, you then give that to humans and they say which one they like better. This is because like reading two short pieces of text and then deciding which one you like better is like within the scope of human capabilities. Uh, whereas like, um, if the thing is putting out two different government economic policies for the next 10 years, uh, which one's better? I don't know. We, we only have one country, so we can't, we can't split it in half and find out. And also it would take 10 years. This is like not the kind of thing that you can supervise. Um, 
And like most of the things that we actually want AGI to do are things that humans are not well positioned to supervise. So it's how do you scale the supervision? Um, and RLHF is progress in that respect, not because it lets you scale to things that humans can't evaluate, but because it lets you efficiently use human evaluations, right? Because rather than just getting the thing out, asking humans, and then using that to run one step of gradient descent, you get this data from humans, use that to train a reward model, which imitates the human judgments. And then the model trains with the reward model so that the, the model that you're actually training can have a very large number of iterations of feedback using this kind of imitation of the of the feedback that the humans would give. Um, clever doesn't solve the hard part of the problem, right? Uh, so then, yeah, so then there's questions of like, can we use that to build something that could help us to supervise things that are a little bit harder? And could we set up some kind of iterative process whereby we keep using these things that are like within the range that we're able to actually evaluate to build things that are capable of something slightly better. And then the combination of people and AI are able to evaluate that slightly better thing to build a slightly better thing and so on. Could we like kind of um, Scaffold. bootstrap our way out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this, uh, I'm not going to say that can't work. Uh, and it seems like one of the more like achievable things in terms of like, can we practically speaking get there from the paradigm that we have now? It's like, it's cool because it's not too far off the current path. Um, so there's like, if we did this, what's the probability it would work? And then like, what's the probability that we actually can do this at all? Right, right. Um, and you kind of want to be exploring things all, all, all everywhere along that Pareto frontier. Um, of like success likelihood to like practicality. Um, but some people are in other places. Some people are like really trying to find things that you can actually make a strong argument that they would definitely work. Um, but those are a bit, so like, for example, if you look at what Miri is doing, um, a lot of their work is about, they just think that we're very, very confused. Uh, and I think I agree with that, that like we're talking, we, we were, before we were talking about agency, we don't have like a really clear sense of what agency is and how it works. And it's like kind of important. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the sort of metaphor there is like, there's a lot of people who are talking about different systems on the rocket and how to build, you know, uh, how to build the various parts of the rocket to like not blow up and so on. And maybe even how to steer the rocket, like how do we have, do we have, some people are like, yes, I really think that the stuff that we've used so far of like aerodynamic steering fins is great. We're just going to point the rocket at the moon and then steer with the fins. It's like, no, probably not. Cause when you're in space, I don't think those fins are going to work. Like metaphorically, there's a bunch of stuff that works when you are, uh, the things that work when you're smarter than the system that you're training that stop working when it's smarter than you or things that work when the system, when you can switch it off that don't work when you can't switch it off or things that work when you can evaluate the outputs that don't work when you can't evaluate the outputs and so on. There's a lot of these like stuff that works on small rockets that doesn't get you to the moon. Um, but yeah, there's people talking about, let's say they've actually got a steering mechanism that can work in the form of like, um, what do they call them? SES or something, there's, you know, those thrusters, the little thrusters around the outside that can change the orientation of a rocket. Cool. Um, but I think Miri's take is like, yeah, sure, but we don't understand orbital mechanics, right? So like you, we think you can't just point the nose of the rocket at the moon and thrust and get there. There's actually complicated dynamics there that you need to understand. And like, and so they're thinking about a bunch of like really basic physics. How does orbital mechanics work? Which direction should you thrust to get into any particular place? Right. Um, right. Or it's possible that we, that we don't have, that it's not just that we don't have orbital mechanics. It's possible that we don't have calculus, right? It's possible that we're missing like some actual really fundamental mathematics 
that you kind of just need as a building block to build the theory necessary to understand like uh, intelligent agency. Um, and so, yeah, often they're doing this stuff where you look at it and you're like, how is that even, what are we, how is this even relevant? Right. Mm -hmm. How you're like stacking a giant pile of imaginary arrows end to end. And we're trying to go to the moon. Like, what's, what's happening here? Um, and they're like, look, unless we understand this, we're, we're not going to hit the moon. Um, which, you know, yeah, makes you sound like a crazy person, but you're not necessarily wrong about that, right? We could, in fact, be in that hopeless of a state. Um, which also, I think, explains a lot of, well, yeah, it explains some proportion of Yudkowsky's, like, pessimism, right? That, like, if that is where we are, if we really are in the process of building a giant moon rocket with everyone on board, and we, in fact, don't know calculus, um, then the situation is actually quite hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully it's not that. But it doesn't seem that implausible to me that that's kind of the situation we're in. What are some of the basic pieces that you think are missing? It, it, it occurs to me that there's actually a lot of really foundational work to be done here, maybe for a philosopher or a neuroscientist or something like that. Just grappling with the question of intelligence, right? I, I don't know that we have a particularly good definition of it. We sort of know it when we see it generally, but it's really easy to anthropomorphize and uh, picture yourself there, which could lead you to either over or underestimate the, the capability of a near future system. And especially with the emergence of something like ChatGPT or these large language models and their future iterations, it seems like there's a, a huge opportunity there for somebody just to try to think through intelligence or arrive at a new definition of it by, you know, inducing over the, the expanded reference class, which now includes artificial agents. And, um, yeah. So I mean, do, yeah. do you have a sense for, for what's missing? What, what's the calculus of this even look like? Oh, uh, I don't know. I do, I do like, I agree with you. I think that the, the state of our knowledge is pretty poor. I think there's enormous potential for, like I was saying, there's like nine different research agendas, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and it still seems pretty feasible to me that the research agenda we should be doing is agenda 10 that nobody's thought of yet. Um, and so there is like, and there's a lot of unknown unknowns and there's a huge amount of opportunities here for people to come in and form their own ideas of what's going on and, um, and make big breakthroughs of that type, right? Like fill in big chunks. But I don't even I don't even know that I could give you a list of where the holes are in the sense that I think there's more holes than filled in bits, right? <laughs> it's not like a thing with holes. It's holes. Yeah. It's it's rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all holes. It's holes all the way down. Um, we don't even know. Uh, it's not we... completely, you know, like we've made progress. There's definitely been progress. There's stuff that we know that we didn't used to, but if Could you give me a few examples of that, what, what are, what are some things like, what, what are a couple pieces of concrete progress that we've made where it's like, you can point to that and say, AI safety has not been useless hand, uh, flailing. We, we know these things now that we didn't then. And they, they do bear in important ways on our eventually solving this problem. It's really hard as well. Um, I know that I can say. <laughs> basically, what basically when I when I when I read the like old discussions, I get a feeling of everyone being a lot more confused about things than we are now. It feels as though we've got some conceptual clarity. We've got some frameworks built up, like ways of thinking about this, um, that seem good or that seem like useful. Um, where we're starting to get a grip at least on like what some of the problems are, um, and achieving somewhat more, like I said that there's these, there's these nine different agendas, but like there is appreciable overlap, right? There are various things that people actually agree on. There are, uh, problems that have been expressed and formalized. Like, okay, here's an example is, um, the concept of, of Mesa optimization. Mm -hmm. Um, for a long time, the like main way that a lot of people were thinking about this was that you have 
you have an optimizer, you give it an objective, it does things in the world. And the challenge is like, how do you pick a good objective? And like, this is the problem that CEV is trying to solve, right? Like what, what is an objective that is safe to optimize as hard as you want? Um, and that is a real problem and still, uh, this is, this has always been a real problem and still is, is like CEV is nice, but, uh, not computable, um, or at least not tractable. So, but then you have this second thing, which is like, well, actually that's not how these things work, right? You actually have an optimizer that produces a system, which then acts in the world and that may itself be an optimizer. And so you actually have these two problems. One of like, how you get the thing from your mind, how do you get the objective from your mind into any AI system? Uh, and then how do you ensure that the thing that actually results from that training process still has that same objective? Um, and there are a bunch of reasons to expect that to not happen. So in a sense, this is like a response to um, the success of machine learning that like it's a, it's a recognizing new problems once you start thinking about these things in a machine learning framework. Um, but that's the kind of thing where it's like new, new ideas that are just like very useful and important have been found and like mostly agreed on. Um, I should, I should have done like a literature review before coming on here because I'm kind of blanking. It's, it's frustrating. Um, when I'm given like, yeah, come up with a list of these or whatever. I don't have those ready to go. So this is good practice. If I'm going to go on podcasts, these are like the types of questions that I need to have done a bit of sort of reminding myself on. Well, glad, glad I could help. If it's any consolation, I moved last week and both my kids have had norovirus. So I meant to do a lot more prep for it and, and wasn't able to do it. So uh, I'm just kind of oh, shooting, firing from, yeah, I'm firing from the hip here as well. So neither of us did the homework or the reading. So, uh, <laughs> We're just fumbling around as best. Yeah, norovirus is nasty. I feel it, it's it's very nasty. It's a good thing we're not in charge of alignment. Um, we're we're not off to a great start. Oh. Um, yeah. no, no, that's a that's actually really useful context. Uh, I, I I like that it's it's now a very crisp expression of that problem. And and I think Yudkowsky got into it a little bit on Lex Friedman's podcast that you you've got the two distinct problems of first giving an agent a robust fully specified goal in the first place, or like a generative process that would create more goals that are conciliant with the original goal. And then you, then you have to worry about the problem of getting it to want the right thing. And I, and I think that's a formulation that wouldn't have been around uh, in 2013 when I was looking at it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, there were people who kind of saw that the, the deep learning thing coming, but, um, not many it's, yeah, yeah. And the problem is that deep learning doesn't, it, it kind of solves some of the problems. Like, it gives you the potential, at least, to actually um, learn objectives rather than having to specify them, right? That's part of the problem is that, like, specifying objectives is hard, but maybe you can specify a process or a procedure by which you could learn them. And so it is interesting that these language models do seem to have some something like common sense right uh and that's in some ways that's helpful because um you at, you at least don't get the thing of the of the system like misinterpreting what you say in a really weird literalist um way and then and then doing something that's completely crazy but in another sense this is not helpful at all because it gives you a false sense of the security, mm. right? It, uh, because what it, this understanding is still kind of brittle and you don't actually know how it works. You don't know how it generalizes. You don't know how it behaves. Like it behaves pretty well within the range of like things that were discussed in the training data, but how does it extrapolate off into strange situations that become possible once you have super intelligence, you don't know. So it, yeah, if it makes some problems easy, but like the core easier, but the core problem is still there. And then you have this 
additional problem of like, oh, but you don't even actually get to build it. You just get to like build some optimization process that spits out something that satisfies some criteria that you have no idea what's going on inside it. So it mostly makes things more difficult. Do you need a dynamic and knowledgeable speaker for an event? Thomas Fry and me, Trent Fowler, are both seasoned keynote speakers able to converse on a wide array of topics to audiences of all sizes and skill levels. Go to the contact page at futuratipodcast.com to book Thomas or myself today and let us apply our years of experience in public speaking to make your event a smashing success. So if it, so the, the uncertainty once again doesn't redound to your to your advantage. It, it ends up actually making the problem harder. Uh, yeah, seems like. Well, is there any reason to be hopeful? Um, you, you indicated a few times you don't think the problem is intractable. We have made real progress, albeit perhaps not enough, or uh, we, we might be in the pre-calculus era of trying to, to build a rocket. But, I mean, on the whole, are, are you at all optimistic about it? Is there any reason at all um, to, to come in at less than 99.9% P-Doom? Oh yeah, my P Dune is not that high. I think I probably only have one nine in my P Dune. Um Is it like, nineteen? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Ninety. Uh, like Yeah, I don't know. Right now I feel like ninety something, but I don't. It's not it's not ninety nine point. Um and that's just kind of based on the practicality of the situation. Um there are a lot of things, there are a lot of solvable problems that we just won't actually solve, right? I do believe the problem is solvable, and therefore I have hope. Um, but I guess, yeah, if you're looking for reasons to be hopeful, um, because being hopeless doesn't help, does it? That's a reason to be hopeful. Uh, but I don't see reasons to be, I don't see reasons to be optimistic. I don't see reasons to be pessimistic either. I think that if you're faced with a difficult situation, you just have to be realistic. You have to, you know, don't be don't be um, looking for. Again, if you go looking for reasons to believe something, you can probably find them, and this is of no bearing to anything, hmm. right? You you have to just look at the world and try and figure out what is most likely to happen, um, and this feels to me like the kind of thing which. Like I say, I think it's like landing a landing a, a person on the moon and bringing them back. It's totally within our power. Um, and I don't know. I, I'm saying that as though I'm like very confident. Maybe it's incredibly hard, right? I don't. Possibly, it's just actually incredibly hard. It doesn't feel incredibly hard to me. It just feels like we're not trying. It feels like the people involved are not approaching it with the um, seriousness that it requires. And in the same way as, you know, trying to write a cryptographic protocol unseriously, there's, there's kind of no question of like, has anyone ever built uh, a cryptographic protocol that's secure by accident? Like it doesn't happen, right? Um, and so most of my hope comes from the possibility that things change. And we are already seeing that. Like we're seeing this being discussed a lot more. It seems as though the general public is much more open to this uh, than the, the people actually working in tech. Um, some kind of thing of like there's, there's no limit to a person's ability to not understand something when their livelihood depends on them not understanding it. Right. Um, but this is not even as bad as that because their livelihood doesn't actually depend on it. It's just like their current research direction. It's not that big of a deal to just shift focus. Um, the proposal is not that we stop doing AI research. It's just like we do the kind of AI research that reduces the probability of everyone dying rather than increases it. Um, and then, like when you when you talk to ordinary people in the street and you say, "Hey, we are like look at look at what ChatGPT can do, look at what GPT four can do." When we look at the scaling curves, it looks as though if we keep making them bigger, they'll keep getting better, at least to some extent. And 
people are trying, people are like basically going about as fast as they can. Not quite. It's actually, it's, it's not as bad as it could be. Um, but people are, people are going pretty fast on this. They themselves acknowledge that this thing potentially poses an extinction risk, but they want to do it anyway. They want to have a go anyway. If you ask them if they understand the thing that they're building, they will happily tell you, no, not at all. Um, some some non-trivial percentage of researchers think that this has like a significant, you know, double digits percentage probability of literally killing literally everyone. How do you feel about this? Never mind that it's going to take your job or whatever. Um, people go, huh, well, maybe stop that right now. Maybe, maybe, maybe don't do that. Also, what the hell? Um... <laughs> And so, and so that to me is where the hope comes from, uh, that people realize what a problem we have and governments realize what a problem we have and we just stop basically that we just stop going bigger. We stop going more powerful and we focus our research on understanding what we have and it doesn't mean like GPT-4 is still a license to print money, right? Mm -hmm. It's still like once it's fully integrated into the economy is, is, um, is producing enormous benefits. Um, so it's not like we don't want to take people's toys away, but can we just, can we just stop rushing headlong into what seems like through fairly basic reasoning to be probably an apocalypse. Um, I think we can, but like, that's where, that's where my hope comes from. My hope of like that continuing on the current path that just works out. Okay. Is, is how it starts with quite a few zeros. Yeah. Um, so the thing before you were talking about, like, what are some things that we've done or what is some, what is some progress? What are some areas? This kind of thing. I do actually have a, a list here of some like recent research that's come out of different places that we could just talk about a few of them. Yeah, please. We should do it. that. Like I don't have them off the top of my head, but I got a list here. So for example, some recent work out of Anthropic uh, is constitutional AI, which is kind of similar to RLHF, except you have the AI system, the full model, uh, the full language model, giving the feedback based on a constitution written by people, right? So rather than being presented with two examples and you say, I like this one better, I like that one better, you just present a list of like, these are the things that it should have and these are the things that, you know, these things it should do, things it shouldn't do. And then the two examples and the list of criteria are given to a language model to give feedback of which of these two does it better. Um, and this is like slightly hopeful because in principle, if you've got models that are, uh, doing better, I mean, firstly, it's nice because it doesn't use too much human time, but secondly, if you have models that are doing things that are beyond the human ability to reliably evaluate, it's possible that the model could still reliably evaluate them. So that might give you a bit more sort of robustness to, um, to the, the failures of human oversight. That's pretty cool research. Might do a video about that. Um, yeah, people are doing interpretability stuff to understand in detail how uh, how transformers work, uh, which again is just like it's one of those things where it's I, I don't really call it hopeful so much as not having it is hopeless. If that makes sense, this is like table stakes. The most right. basic level of understanding of how transformers actually do their computations internally, like specific ones, trained ones, um, but good, right? Definitely very worthwhile research. Um, Definitely. There are things like oh, goalless generalization from DeepMind. People are studying specifically what what are the the properties and the circumstances in which this thing happens where the model learns the wrong goal. 
or the model the model learns a goal which then generalizes uh incorrectly out of distribution and like more broadly this whole area of like robustness where a lot of the problems that we have a lot of the like safety problems come from this thing of you've trained something and it's learned something and you don't really know what it's learned and so you don't know how that is going to behave in novel situations that didn't occur during training um and so like one of the, the, the biggest example of this is like if you're training something with something like RLHF, how do you know and, and it starts doing well? How can you tell the difference between learning to want to do what humans want and learning to want to do what will result in the humans giving you a high reward? Right. Right. First one much safer than the second one right because the second one has this flip when you're out of distribution uh which is what happens when you get the option to get high reward without humans right so as long as you're kind of weak and uh under control and so on you'll do the correct thing but then as soon as you believe that you have the possibility like someone was talking this through as a concrete example let's say you've got a model that's being tasked with um it's like a computer security ai system and its job is to protect the um you know to be sort of a cyber security overseer for some companies systems um if it's re <clears throat> if it's reasoning like do what the humans want then it will protect against it you know maybe it's being attacked by another ai system um but if it is reasoning like do uh, do what will get me high reward, which throughout its entire life and training has meant doing what the humans want, but that's not the same thing. When it's thinking about the possibilities here, it might think, well, I could block this attacking AI, but I could also collaborate with it because if it can get in, uh, maybe it can... Um, directly change my reward so that right if it's going to hack into the system maybe it can set it up so that when they give me a thumbs up i get a thumbs up and when they give me a thumbs down i get a thumbs up um and i'll take that right like that's preferable so on the one sense this is bad because it allows that um it allows the attacker into your system and your stuff gets stolen or whatever and now you've lost any influence over your ai system but also worse than that you have the potential for cascading failures. If you have a large number of systems that are in this situation where they're doing what uh, they're doing what you want only because you have this power over them, then if a sort of um, a, a robot uprising, you know, starts to happen, right? If uh, if some system decides that it's time to take over. You might actually get all of these other systems going along with it because they were never on your side to start with, really. And the the real possibility of actually overthrowing the humans is a thing that never happened during training. And so your training process is unable to like differentiate between doing the right thing and waiting uh, and only doing it sort of instrumentally. Um so yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of study of like how what are the training circumstances that result in this kind of misgeneralization and then interpretability things of like, how do you actually detect it? Um, uh, yeah. And then there's a bunch of like obvious stuff that doesn't reliably work. Like you might hope that you could do some adversarial training where you, um, you try and fake scenarios where it has power over you. Right. Right. Um, but then you have to be really, you don't know that you, you it's, so, it's so hard to actually know whether you've trained something to not do bad things or you've trained something to not get caught doing bad things. Mm -hmm. um, chances are your training process will involve some minor bad things that it doesn't get caught doing. And therefore the learning to not do bad things and get caught is actually a better, was just going to get you higher reward than 
learning to actually not want to do bad things because sometimes doing bad things gives you the opportunity to get an extra reward. Um, yeah, so a bunch of research into that stuff. Um, oh yeah, there's also been some interesting research into identifying agency. Yeah, like, that's right. It's very important. Right? Like you, you get given this giant uh, block of floating point numbers, just like here's a bunch of matrices with numbers. Is there an agent in there? Right? Does this have agent-like properties? How do you go about answering that question? Uh, there's a bunch of research into that. Could we could we detect agency in some systematic way? Um, yeah, which feels like super important and super difficult and very interesting. Uh, what else? Yeah, yeah. Then there are a bunch of these different schemes that involve having a bunch of different AI systems. You know, things like debate where you have multiple, you have these two sort of opposing AI systems that are trying to argue opposite sides. And the sort of working assumption is that evaluating, if, if, you, if you've got the type of thing where evaluating things is cheaper than generating them, then like maybe if you have two equally powerful systems trying to come up with arguments for opposite sides of a thing, it's easier for a human being to just tell which one of them is correct than um, to like generate that, uh, to generate those arguments or, or whatever themselves, um, which has some potential. The kind of amplification stuff we were talking about before of like, can you can you come up with some scheme whereby you can sort of steadily increase the power of the systems by teaming up with earlier versions? And, uh, right. Yeah. A centaur yeah, ladder, you just kind of climb it up. Makes me nervous. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad people are looking at it. Um, and then what else have we got? Oh yeah, stuff about polysemanticity. Like part of the problem with trying to interpret neural networks is that you end up with these neurons, which like you you might hope, and everybody like everybody likes to think this about systems. They go, oh, we're going to find the gene for height, or for you know Parkinson's disease. Um, and like, usually you don't get one gene, right? Like, so, like eye color, I think you get basically one gene, whatever, but like most things are massively polygenetic. Um, similar, similar type of thing in, uh, I mean, for totally different reasons, but like, you might hope that you can find the neuron, the deception neuron that's only on when the model is deceiving you and off otherwise. Um, and this is not the case. Um, but you do sometimes get like an image classifier. So you do sometimes get like, oh, this actually is like a, a fur neuron or something like that, right? This triggers for fur, and this happens both for pictures of cats and pictures of dogs. Uh, and the later layers are kind of aggregating these. Uh, and so if you can find the fur neuron, that's cool, because now you've really understood something about what's happening inside your model, mm -hmm. uh, rather than it just being a black box. Awesome. And Chris Ola's circuits work is doing a lot of this. So just like, how do we find these subwebs? But then you often end up with a lot of neurons that are like, yeah, this is fur and also like vertical text and also um, like the, 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 the texture of cardboard or something like that, right? Corrugated cardboard. It's like, why, why is there one neuron that fires for these three like completely unrelated things? Under what circumstances does that happen? Um, so this is like this is like the research. How how does this happen? Why does this happen? And it's something like you're just it's just more efficient that way. Like if you can use a neuron for multiple things, then you gain the ability to recognize more things. And as long as they're things that don't tend to show up at the same time, it actually doesn't cause confusion because the later neurons can tell from context what that neuron firing actually means. Um, but it's kind of annoying. So then there's this, there's this other question of like, can we come up with training schemes that result in networks that don't do this as much? Is there some kind of regularization that we can apply? Or is there some kind of architecture design, some activation function, some, something we can do to try and get each neuron in our system to actually just be one thing, um, preferably without too big of a performance hit, 
because then right. we can train our big AGI with that. And then we have like a better chance of figuring out what it's doing internally. Um, and that's pretty interesting, pretty involved machine learning. Research. These are kind of like randomly selected from my like list of things that I've recently found interesting. Um, but I, hopefully that gives some kind of a taste of like the kind of research that's going on and uh, the, the, the type of sort of problems that we have. The level we're at, shall we say? No, I, I love it. I think that's a that's that's a great note to wrap up on, and hopefully, we'll give some indication as to where philosophically or mathematically or technically minded people could focus their their efforts. Um, on the plus side, one reason for optimism is a lot of this stuff is really really cool, and you know, there's there's a lot of really great work to be done, and so it's uh, a place for an enterprising person starting out in their career you know it's so cool like it's the most it's by far the most interesting thing that you could be working on right because it's like a really hard technical problem it's super important and it has a really fascinating mixture of like really rigorous um and like specific mathematics and machine learning and um theoretical computer science but also these quite philosophical questions that there's, there's a particular type of thinking where it's like, we have this abstract idea of like agency or, you know, safety or power seeking or, um, you know, instrumental convergence or whatever. How do we actually like formalize that? How do we get this to a state where our understanding of it is so sharp that we can do mathematics with it? Um, and that's like a skill set, the, 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 the skill of creating new mathematics, of creating new theoretical computer science, which we probably need, is to me like enormously interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I've always been kind of amazed that people can bring themselves to work on other things. When this is like obviously, obviously the most interesting thing in the field by a long way. Like, do you want to just do like engineering, just like make things bigger? And just like figure out how to optimize some little ML thing to like, no, you want to understand, presumably, you want to understand the nature of intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be a thinking thing that's, imbe that's embodied, that's embedded in the real world, that's making decisions, that wants things? What does it mean to be something that wants things? And what do we actually want? Right. Like these are uh, fundamentally, these are the questions. How do we get at that? And not how do we get at that with like abstract philosophical, like bullshit that you can argue about for, for thousands of years. Like I'm here at the keyboard. I want to program something in. We need this on a deadline. This is like, I don't know. I have a hard time expressing it. Um, but I think that may have, the, there's a certain type of person who that may have got through to. But like, this is obviously the most interesting problem obviously well fantastic um i really appreciate your time thanks for doing the interview with us and hopefully it reaches a few of those people and we can move the needle forward reduce p doom so much. Sh shave another nine off off your estimate there <laughs> yeah let's have it